Okay, greetings everybody. Uh, today's topic on this third um, uh, lecture uh, discussion that you'll respond to on the prompt by 8 o'clock a.m. on Monday morning is, are, I guess should say, physical concerns. Most of these, I think, are really, really obvious and ones you've probably heard before and experienced and such, but I think these are all things that we forget um, and take for granted and they get out of whack and um, they either as individual elements or as a combination of a lot of uh, deficiencies on many elements uh, without us even realizing it start impacting our own and of course our students uh, playing behaviors making it harder to play harder to improve on their instrument that they use for music making uh, basic thing is trust your instincts on whatever instrument the child's playing comfort at all times that it should be the most ergonomic thing that needs to be in your vocabulary um, and all people are not created equal uh, on almost any aspect that you could look at and so it's not one size fits all though there are some correct tendencies that we want to see and uh, uh, most normally can look for uh, exhibits or signs of things that were being successful but these don't apply universally there seems there's always a few exceptions to things uh, especially some instruments more than others. Um, general thing, tension works against us. You'll hear a lot of people say that well, there should be no tension at all. Well, you know, if there wasn't tension in our, our universe at all, we'd all be floating up towards the moon right now or something. So uh, tension is part of it, but we don't want to think of it as tension. We don't want, it, let me rephrase that, we don't want intentional tension. Um, there is resistance in the horn in most cases. There is weight of the instrument. Those are all things that are um, unintentional tension that we can't do anything about. It's, it's just laws of physics working against us. But we want to avoid tension at all possible times. Our overall goal is, in regard to air, um, avoid restricting the air within the human body in any way that's abnormal. Where that tends to ha happen is up and through this area here. Um, with the throat and so forth because you have all these muscles that can contract and expand and you've got your sinuses and all kinds of things that can come into play that really don't need to. Um, really should be just as simple as a, a bag made of muscle that's containing two billows which are your lungs that then can be compressed and then your esophagus is simply just a windpipe that the air should pass through. We don't want it any more complicated than that. One thing that helps with little kids and maybe big kids too is don't use the word tension. Okay? There's that whole um, self efficacy thing that comes up sometimes when we talk about something too much. It actually ends up happening because we almost will it to happen. Um, so just avoid the word tension and use lots of words about calming and, and show that in your demeanor and so forth. Also realize that correct posture for a very 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 high percentage of the population um, that that aren't suffering from any major uh, uh, um, skeletal defects or muscular defects is very natural um, if you were to go as I always use this example if you were to go down to the student union building right now and just pull up a chair and watch people walk back and forth besides seeing all kinds of different people I think if you specifically looked at them in terms of their posture I don't think you would see too many deficiencies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in that, and some of the things I'm talking about are, you know, if you tip your head forward, that creates. Some people walk that way, but that creates a lot of tension and so forth. Um, the, the, just the way they use their lower body is is very ergonomic. Um, most people do keep their head up when they're not thinking about it um, high, and it feels more natural and stuff. So. Kids do know right posture, and it, and it comes from how they move their bodies around with their feet um, and that. So correct posture is natural. One good thing to do is, because all kids are different, is to get to know your students in terms of what their posture or their ideal posture looks like. Um, I've ha heard people advocate before um, uh, in, in initial stages, taking some time maybe to have students stand up without instruments or anything and maybe you get in the center of a circle and just simply ask students to walk around a circle, walk around you, and give you an opportunity to see where their body sort of naturally goes so that when you go to address how they're um, 
their body fits with the instrument they're playing and how it fits with the chair they're sitting into, all those other factors that are going to modify that standing posture, you've got some insight into why they might look a certain way. Uh, it can be deceptive. Sometimes we see people sitting in a chair um, and we, uh, or let me say this, sometimes we see people standing and they're very tall, say 6'3", six, 6'4", six, but when they sit down, they may actually be one of the shorter people in the room. There are people that are very long torso and very um, with shorter legs, and vice versa, short torso, very long legs. So um, it, you, you, can, you can draw some good um, uh, material, some good data, just from those observations of having them do that. Then another idea of as they're walking, moving around in that, be observant. Um, look at their knees, look at their hips, look at their ankles. Tell them to feel what's your knee doing, what's your ankle doing. Where are your shoulders right now? Where's your head right now? Is it leaning forward? Does it feel better if you bring it back, if it is leaning forward? Think about where's your chin placement normally, okay? And what, what do we have to use to move our chin? You know, and they quickly come to discovery, well, that's my jaw. Um, the chin really isn't an independent thing at all. It's the point of the jaw um, that we just label the chin. So, you know, make them very, very aware of those things. As you're doing this, and this needs to be stressed, don't touch kids, okay? 20 years ago, you could probably touch kids in any way and no one would misconstrue anything. Now, you're probably taking a risk. Um, what I like to use when you do have to, you know, identify something is use an inanimate object, preferably without a point. So if I want, me, you know, myself to raise my chin, put this under my chin and raise it up as opposed to my finger. This is very, very personal. This is not personal at all. It, it is very, um, um, what would you say, um, unhuman, uh, I guess inhuman, ha ha ha, right, okay? But you know, same thing, if you're gonna uh, put a finger on a back lightly, put an end of a pencil, the, rub, the eraser end of a pencil, that kind of thing. Um, raising horns, so something, and make sure it's nothing that's gonna be construed as, um, how do I want to say, um, confrontational in what you use. Nothing with a point. Like this pen, because of the rounded ends on both of it, it's really, really good for it. Um, another thing that might be good, oh, of course I can't find it, yeah. Um, you know, these styluses they sell for um, iPads and iPhones and such, touch screen devices and that. There's even a rubber end on it. You really can't do too much harm with it. And they're very lightweight and they're cheap. So think about that. So no touching, no touching. Um, natural shapes and positions, okay? For most children, natural shape of the mouth is simply that M position that they go into. Most children naturally have a slight overbite. Some have underbites, some have severe overbites. That changes. Doesn't necessarily mean one thing or another other than to be aware of it as you move forward and everything. In terms of the hands, we want to be aware that when we're just walking around in a circle or walking naturally, our hands drop to the sides and they sh fall into the shape of a flat C. Okay, sort of a C shape, but it's flattened. It's not round out like this. This is tense. This is very normal. This is very normal. And if you think about it, those flat C's, that's your hand position for almost every instrument. You know, trumpet, clarinet, oboe, saxophone, bassoon. Um, the ones we have to be careful of that we have to distort the hand position, the, the biggest one is flute with that left hand having to create that balance point, that chair right here, does distort that flat C into a distorted hand position, okay? Also, don't, don't forget to address how the hands protrude off of the forearms via the wrist, and don't let those things become, you know, distorted in a way that's gonna create tension, either way up holding something or way down holding something, okay? Um, Ideally, as we begin these processes, we want to make sure that the muscles are as soft as possible. In other words, they're not disengaged and able to do that. We have to have balance. Uh, balance is sort of the key to everything. And uh, we want to balance our torso to our platform. We want to balance our head on top of our spine. Um, the minute we bring our head particularly out of balance, because it weighs 8 to 10 pounds, we engage all kinds of muscles that don't need to be engaged and that are gonna um, unintentionally create all kinds of uh, tension. 
Obviously, the one you guys are probably most familiar with are the slope of the shoulders. Again, know your kids. Some kids naturally have very sloped shoulders. Some kids very naturally have raised shoulders. You know, don't embarrass the kid by asking him to relax his shoulders when that's just where they are. So, learn that, okay? Getting into the next section here, introducing and beginning, beginning use of the two of the three most important self-assessment questions. Okay, well, the three questions, of course, are how does it feel, how does it look, and how does it sound? We might think that, well, the one that really matters is how it sounds, because we're making music, and that's what matters. The problem is the self-assessment process doesn't allow us to do that, and the teacher assessment process very often, especially at the beginning stages, doesn't allow us to do that. We can't rely on what we hear. First off, what we hear is very inconsistent because they're not doing things consistently yet. Um, one time it's one way, the next time it's something else. They haven't had enough repetition to develop the full muscle memory to, to be consistent in that. Students, for the most part, are going to react to something that you can't, you can only guess at, and that's how it feels. So if they take that clarinet for the first time or the clarinet mouthpiece and barrel for the first time and place it and they go to blow, first thing you'll see is their reaction to how that feels, that reed vibrating inside their mouth and the vibration of that sound going up through their dental structure, through their, um, their bone structure. Um, and it, it's crazy and all kinds of things change based on that and it's, it's totally natural. You have to be patient with them and teach them not to react to that. Do things the way it needs to be and make it look right, okay, or look right for them. That's the key point right there, look right for them. You as the teacher, as they're making all these adjustments based on how they feel, and I can testify for you guys starting flute, starting trombone, trumpet, whatever, oboe, bassoon, your faces when you first made first sounds were not your normal faces. Even though I tried to preface you into everything natural, you're fully developed ad adults. You can imagine what kids who sort of like to make faces anyway, a lot of times, um, tend to do. Back to you as a teacher though, you have to make almost all your decisions and assessments with beginners on how does it look. You can't hear them. You can't trust what you hear. It helps to be able to hear them. It helps to try to diagnose what you're hearing but mostly you're going to be hearing them in large groups and you need to keep them actively engaged in large groups so the composite of what you hear doesn't give you very much really clear information so you have to become a pro at scanning scanning uh, certain things uh, particularly and I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit as they play scan the, t the, the areas that become sort of tells for you your chin your chin is your tell for teeth placement. Are the teeth forward? Or are the teeth recessed? Is the mouth open? Is the mouth too closed? The chin is about the only thing you can see that might give you some sort of hint of that depending on whether it's forward and flat or bunched up and protruded back or brought way down low or whatever. Whatever would be appropriate for what you're asking them to do. Same thing as they go to play what goes on above their mouth. Do the nostril excuse me, do the nostrils flare, do their eyeballs raise, do their eyes squint, anything like that's telling you they're using unnecessary tension. They're, 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 they're fighting the process. It should be just as easy as breathing in and out, but with a little bit more muscular support on the exhale. Um, so your eyes need to be very much focused on their faces. So if you're one of these individuals that kind of has a problem making eye contact, good eye contact with kids, or people that you're not very familiar with, you need to work on getting over that. And that's why one thing when you get into your future education classes here, we'll be very big about you not visually dwelling on the score. And most of what you're going to be working with with these kids, you can memorize in a heartbeat. You don't need to be looking at music. You need to be looking at them. Okay, and then it goes beyond that, the hand position. Are their, are their hands cragged and jagged and, you know, like that? Or are they letting the instrument, depending on what instrument it is, balance on their hands? So again, we want it very ergonomic. Uh, wrinkled foreheads, that sort of thing. Red foreheads, puff cheeks, obviously. But learn for different instruments what tells are going to be positive indicators and negative indicators. And then, of course, also trust your um, instincts on what you're hearing as that progresses and goes on. 
Okay, um, back to balance again. Remember, the head balances on the shoulders. Think of the shoulders and your spine as a shelf. Think of your head as a bowling ball. It's easier to hold a bowling ball on a shelf than it is to put it, your fingers in it and hold it out in front of you. This is fatiguing. This you can do the rest of your life without having to engage very much muscularly at all. All right. Um, student awareness of air. Let them understand that when they breathe normally, they breathe through their nose most often. But the most efficient way to quickly breathe is mouth breathing. Of course, because this passageway is narrower, it's longer, and it tends, depending on allergies and um, health conditions, tends to be more open or blocked sometimes than others. This is larger, it's shorter to get to the esophagus, and it's immediate. So we want to learn and stress to breathe through the mouth, especially for those of you that are string players, percussionists. That may be seem like something that, wow, I never thought about that. Wind players, you may not have ever thought about it because you just do it naturally. But breathing through the nose while playing a wind instrument is very, very inefficient. And again, can lead to a lot of tension because of that. Um, but we want them to learn how to breathe normal. Again, when they're walking around that circle, make them aware of how are you breathing? Where's the air going in your body? I bet every one of them will probably be able to tell you once they get in touch with that, it's going to their waist, three-dimensionally around their waist, around their belt line. That's where you want the air to be all the time. That's where it naturally goes. That's what we want to play a wind instrument. You don't have to modify it. You just have to make sure they don't modify it negatively. Um, so you're really being uh, more cautionary than you are uh, in any kind of new instruction on all this and they have to get the feel for it going through their mouth so that it feels the same as whatever. Uh, you want to get real drastic to breathe right, have the kids lay down on their back. Put their hand behind the lower part of their back and just breathe. Maybe ask them just to go home at bed at night and do it on their own and feel how they breathe when they're laying down. When we're laying down, when we're sleeping, again, barring any kind of conditions or anything, we breathe properly and we breathe very, very efficiently. So we're all good there. Um, Breathing then too, um, and this, this may not be a 100% statement, but I think it's one worth selling beginners on, the air never stops. And what I mean by that is the air goes in, and immediately when the air's in, it goes back out. There is no set point. Again, percussionists, string players, you don't, and then hold the air and set it, and then release it. There's something to be said that that seems logical in some way, and actually I had a couple band directors early in my life that taught that. Um, it ends up with an explosion, because when you set your air, what do you do? You tense your entire body. Tension's bad. No tension. So it's in and it's out. It's continuous turnover. It's continuous turnover. And the air doesn't change as you articulate. All right, so try to get them to think of the, the, the breathing and blowing system, which is one and the same, as a mechanical system that they don't really control, except when they start using their valve, which is their tongue. And then the valve works separately, but it doesn't impact the air, um, the air system. It does impact the air itself, the air stream, okay? Um, inside the oral cavity on brass instruments, really important that whatever um, width of lead pipe we're going to be projecting air through to vibrate that we create as close as possible a, the same size um, air column in our aperture here. Um, the instruments on woodwinds that we close up around we want to make sure where the teeth are open the double reed instruments are very wide open flute very wide open double reed instruments flute we want a wide open oral cavity so there's lots of room because that serves as part of the instrument more so it does on every instrument but more so on those instruments where we get that resonance inside our, our embouchure too in addition to the resonance of the instrument and that darkens the sound that makes everything uh, more vibrant as we have that going um, tongue placement 90 I would this says 98 percent I think at a point 90 probably 99% of the time, the tongue is in the bottom of the mouth. Just like it is when you're walking down the hall. Uh, it's not hanging out, it's not smacking around on the top of your mouth, it's just down. Out of the way, allowing the air to go through. As far as tongue placement, 
tongues, just like everything else, are completely different shaped. What I like telling kids to identify, and this sort of takes care of the differences, is to have them find their first taste bud. If you take your finger, and you could do this a lot of different ways, but this is just the way I do it, and if you've got a substance on the end of your finger that you know is edible, but you don't know if it's sweet or sour, think how you would test that with your tongue. And wherever that touches, that's your first taste bud. That is your strike point for articulating. That first taste bud is where you want articulating. Whether it's striking the reed, whether it's striking the teeth, whatever it has to do in the case of that instrument, it's the first taste bud that is the strike point. And that strike point is firm and quick. So it hits and immediately the tongue back into the mouth. And it's not necessarily a back and forth motion, it's more of an up and down motion. It feels different for different people in their interpretation. And as we talked about in class, um, their interpretation of it generally is not very good. Okay? That's pretty much what I had um, on all of this and that. Uh, you post your discussion questions. We'll have some time in class to talk about this and talk through it and everything too. And this is the, one of those areas that seems real obvious, but it's like you always learn something new about it and there's always different ways to interpret it because it's not one size fits all whatsoever, but there are some really good solid principles that we have to apply to everybody. With that, that is that. Thank you.